Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the best recordings of the Brahms Violin Concerto. This is a talk I have been dreading, sort of like the German Requiem. Why was I dreading it? Well, violin concertos, the great violin concertos, are really, really difficult to talk about because the fact of the matter is there are about, you know, five of them, you know, six. I mean, you can count the number of them on the fingers of, you know, two hands, maybe one hand, if you're very particular. And as a result of that, every violinist in the universe records them, usually more than once. And so you could make a talk just on one violinist's version of one violin concerto. I mean, there are so many fine recordings of the Brahms Violin Concerto. I mean, it's one of the top three, easily. I mean, you know, the top three, like Beethoven, Brahms, Tchaikovsky, something like that. If you just sort of take those, you have 30 trillion different recordings. And it's not that I can't pick out the best ones or great ones. That's easy because there are just so many of them. I mean, it's, it's almost an unlimited supply. And I really, really do not want to get into a situation where, you know, I pick out a bunch of them and then you, my beloved viewers, pick out your bunch of them and we have a discussion about nothing because our, our bunches never coincide. It's really an issue. I like these talks and the comments that come with them since I have to read all of them and and monitor them, as you know I do. I like them to be in total, that is the video plus all the comments, um, a means of people who don't know the work to get a sense of not just my choices, but yours and what the consensus is and, and you know how everyone feels about it. And it's so hard when there are so many recordings. And, and here's the really big, dirty, dirty, critical secret that you all know anyway, but I'm, it doesn't hurt to mention it, and that's this. We, we critics, we, we tend to exaggerate differences between recordings for the sake of the point. I mean, I never do, of course, never, never. I've never exaggerated anything in my life, and you, you could all attest to that, right? The fact is, the standard of performance is really, really high. And the standard of performance in one of the two or three greatest ever works written for the instrument is even higher. It's incredibly high. So most violinists do not play the Brahms concerto unless they're really up for it. And what that means is that the differences between one performance and the next are often very, very small. We make a big deal about them. You know, the finale, right? The finale goes, da, 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 ba, da, 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 bum, 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 bum. Well, some people go, da, 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 bum, 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 da, 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 da. You know, that pause and exaggerated thing that they do. And it's, it's traditional. It's one of those unwritten things that you can do. And it's a very interesting question. If the orchestra does it, will the soloist do it? If the soloist does it, will the orchestra do it? Will they both do it? But really, who cares? <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, who gives a damn? What difference does it make? And that's a big difference that you can hear. Imagine, I mean, how could you be a critic? How could I possibly convey useful information if I say violinist X holds the quarter note at the end of measure 428 a bazillionth of a second longer than violinist Y. I mean, we're talking about tiny, tiny microscopic differences in a sea of basically fabulousness. So, so that makes these talks kind of unrewarding. You know what I mean? You know, you want to be able to say, ah, that sucks. This is fabulous. And there's only one great recording in the universe. Not with the Brahms Violin Concerto. I mean, there's like 50 great recordings in the universe and another hundred or two that are excellent. And, you know, which one you listen to is up to you. You just pick one. I, I feel like I'm abdicating my critical responsibility. So in an event, in, in, in an effort to reclaim some vestige of my shattered legitimacy as a critic, I have my top 10 
violinists in this work. Not necessarily my top 10 performances or recordings because, as I said, a lot of these people did them more than once. And I've left out some really, really, really big names. I mean, you're not going to see Perlman. You're not going to see Zagetti. I mean, they're not some of the real historical ones. Bronislaw Huberman. I mean, there's so many I could name that I am not naming because, well... Because as a combination of performance and sound, I think that these are the top 10-ish. I also think that, well, it's really going to be, as as I said, more than 10 because of the duplication. But I also wanted to emphasize, once again, that just because it's old, that doesn't make it wonderful. This piece used to be one of the great formidable challenges in violinosity. But now... Now, I mean, violinists wake up in the morning and play it before breakfast and then go on to something difficult. That doesn't mean they're going to give a great performance. But technically, it holds no challenges to, you know, today's hotshot violinists. And and there have been many, times many, who have done it superbly well. And so of these 10 violinists, six are, relatively speaking, and I mean relatively speaking, you know, Um, younger or newer or not the golden age violinists. Four of them are. And that's where I'm going to leave it because I just don't see the point in, in, in going further unless you happen to be a completely nutso collector who wants every performance of the piece or who, you know, can't be happy with just 15 or 20. Um, and, you know, that, that, if that's you, where you are, wonderful. But, of course, if that's where you are, then the whole discussion is kind of academic because you know you're going to get it anyway, and you're going to listen to it anyway. So let us just go through the list and do our best within a reasonable amount of time because I don't want this to be another hour-long you know, extravaganza where we talk about you know, the same piece with the same players over and over and over again, you know? Uh, it's really, it's really extraordinary. It really is. Of course, the Brahms Violin Concerto is an amazing piece of music. I mean, I don't need to tell you. That's why all of the violinists in the universe play it. It has a a perfect balance of virtuosity, because it's a much more virtuosic piece than like the Beethoven Concerto is, and symphonic construction and fabulous, fabulous, fabulous melodies. I mean, it's just top-notch in terms of its melodic inspiration, which a violin concerto has to be, because a violin is, above all, a melody instrument, and you've got to have the tunes, or else there's just no point in hearing them when spun out on a violin. But in addition, because it was written for Joachim, Brahms leaves room for an improvised cadenza, which most violinists play, of course, the one written by Joachim, but others have done others, and sometimes we hear a different one. So there's that element of potential surprise in it and that element of challenge to the violin virtuoso if they care to take it up. I mean, it's just got the whole enchilada. And it's as far as violin concertos goes, go, I mean... I mean, there really is none finer. I mean, that's 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 the bottom line, especially for concertos in the classical form. That is, with a big orchestral introduction and a genuine, you know, equality of participation between the violin and the orchestra. It is also one of Brahms' best pieces in terms of its orchestration, in terms of its balance between the solo and the violin. And that was not a strength of Brahms normally. It really wasn't, but boy, he pulled out all the stops on this one because he was writing it for his friend and because his friend was a much better orchestrator than he was and he knew it and he was not going to uh, disappoint its dedicatee, Joachim. So with all of that said, let's just go through the the piles and I'm going to save my like, you know, total favorite version for last, I think. I think. Let's do the newcomers first. 
because I think it's just a very, very interesting list. And remember, this is not an order of preference until I get to the end where I'll give you my personal preference. But, you know, I, otherwise, it's, it's just a mishmash. And I've just divided them into two pieces of 10 violinists, six newer, younger ones, and four old, dead ones. Okay? Let's see. I don't think any of these newer ones are dead which is sort of a novel concept in the world of classical music. So first, this is really quite recent, I think. Uh, it's really very, very fine. Um, Vadim Repin, fantastic Vadim Repin, a wonderful Russian violinist and with Shai and the Gavant House. You know, this is in Shai's kind of quasi period, speeding things up a little bit more zippily phase which is quite wonderful. You also get the double concerto with Trolls Mork. I mean, this is a terrific record. It really, really is. And Repin is just a smashing violinist. He's got, you know, the Russian school. The Russian school is really something in this music. It really is. They have that wonderful beefy tone and, 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 and the songfulness and that passion that you want in violin music. It's all here. So... That and Repid is just a wonderful one to start with. And like I said, I'm only really identifying these by the violinist because, well, you'll see. Next, oh yes, yes indeedy, Christian Tetzloff. Now, there's also the German Violin School. The German Violin School, of which Tetzloff is one of the, the two great current exponents, I think, um, is, is a very different sounding from the Russian. They don't throb quite like the Russians like to throb. You know, they are a leaner, leaner type of sonority, quite crisp in rhythm, very tasteful in their handling of vibrato. And I, I love this style of playing. I really do. And I think Tetzloff is such a fantastic violinist. And I wish, I wish, I wish that he had gotten more he got more, gets, you know, that he got more, gets more attention than he's been getting because he's really first class all the way. And this is with, uh, let's see, the Danish National Symphony Orchestra under Thomas Dalsgaard. A wonderful disc. It's on Virgin Classics. It was. Whether, whether it's still around or what it's on, who knows? Who knows? Next. Oh, one of the really, really great, 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 great modern ones, Gil Shaham. Now, Gil Shaham has done it twice. This is the more recent one. I did a separate video on this where he's playing with the Knights, with a K, under Eric Jacobson, and it's the Beethoven and the Brahms violin concertos on one very, very well-filled disc with notes by that fabulous Brahms scholar, Styra Evans, who happens to be a friend of mine, which is why I'm giving her a plug. And this performance is quite different from Shaham's first version. But his first version is with Claudio Abbado and the Berlin Phil. And that, I, I mean, I think it's, I like it better than this one. I think this is very interesting. And I have to give Shaham props, as I said in that review, for doing two completely different reviews of the work. One very chamber-like and swifter, the other far more traditional and hot and heavy romantic. But however you do it, Shaham's playing is just extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. And the Abado one on Deutsche Grammophon as well is, is stunning, absolutely stunning. It's also coupled with an amazing double concerto. So Shaham is definitely one of the great exponents of the Brahms concerto in modern times. And I mean, he's as good as anybody, as anybody ever has been. And Abado's Brahms was the best thing he ever did for Deutsche Grammophon. So you put them together and you have, wow, really something, absolutely something. Or you can get this one with the Beethoven, which is terrific. So there. Next. Oh, this is an interesting one. I was just playing it again the other day. Um, it's really quite marvelous and I love the coupling. Hilary Hahn. Now, Hilary Hahn, you know, was a child marvel violinist. I saw her live quite a few times and she was really super. She's very, very fine. And, you know, the interesting thing about this is that, is that, you know, she made her first recordings, these five on here, for Sony. Then she decamped to 
Deutsche Grammophon, from whence she seems to have fallen into a black hole of catgut and rosin. I don't know what she's doing, but not very much. She's made a few discs for them. Yes, she has. They haven't been anything like as interesting as these, which have, you know, most of the major concertos. You've got the Beethoven and coupled with Bernstein's Serenade. The couplings were interesting. You get three of the viol uh, the Bach uh, sonatas and partitas. I wish she'd done the rest. Here you get Barber and Edgar Meyer, and you get Mendelssohn and Shostakovich. The couplings are so much fun. But the Brahms is coupled with the Stravinsky Violin Concerto. And that, I think, is really, really an interesting coupling. Because the two composers could not possibly more be further apart aesthetically, but somehow it kind of works. It really does. And the performances are really great. They're with the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields and Neville Mariner. Remember him? It, they're, they're very, very good. They are in the sort of lighter, fleeter um, style of, of the uh, newer generation, at least the newer non-Russian generation. But the Brahms is, of course, a, a classicizing work. And the Stravinsky is more than a classicizing work. And so, like I said, the approach kind of puts them together in such a curious way. It's a fun disc to play completely. So you hear the contrast, you know, in real time. It's quite, quite something. So Hilary Hahn's wonderful. Then we have, oh, yes, Maxim Vengerov. Terrific, sensational violinist. The, the, this is with Baron Boim. And I'm, this is the complete Vengerov box. It's on Warner. And, I, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing not to love here. He had such a beautiful tone. He's the real sort of successor to David Oistrakh, about whom we will hear more anon, uh, I, I think, you know, both in terms of his approach and in, in terms of his, his you know, just the, the richness of his cantabile is absolutely gorgeous. You know, violinists, violinists more than any other instrumentalists are like singers. I mean, that's why the violin was as popular as it was. That's why it predominates in the orchestra, because it is the instrument par excellence, which can imitate the human voice, not in, in timbre, of course, but in terms of its expressive intensity, its communicativeness. And that, of course, is because you have vibrato, you stupid period instrument morons. That's what it's for. And so... And so a violinist is able to personalize their tone as long as they use vibrato and other, some other things as well. But th th that's one of the biggies, to personalize their tone just like a singer does. And, and so a lot of whether you'll enjoy a performance of this concerto or any concerto, but particularly the romantic concertos, depends on the extent to which the soloist really manages to, to create a personal communicative experience and a lot of today's violinists don't bother to do that the young ones they can technically they can do anything anything at all but they have absolutely nothing to say in the music and they're not speaking through the music but Vengerov, that was never an issue he just does it and so this is a great brahms violin concerto um, which i return to with great pleasure frequently and finally my second great violinist of the German school, Thomas Zeitmeier. Thomas Zeitmeier is fantastic. He really is. He's just a brilliant, brilliant violinist. His repertoire has been rather, rather slender. I mean, this disc is, this box on Warner is 15 CDs. I mean, it's pretty good, but there's a lot of chamber music in it. His concerto repertoire has not been as extensively recorded as some of these other people, but his Brahms is with Dohnani in Cleveland, and it was part of that fabulous um, Brahms symphony cycle that Dohnani in Cleveland did, which is absolutely one of the great Brahms cycles out there. So this is a beautiful performance with two interpreters who are absolutely of one mind as to how the music is supposed to go. It's that, it's that classical, chiseled, uh, somewhat cool emotionally, but but still, you know, warmly romantic. I mean, it's not like stylistically demented, and it's it's beautifully beautifully musical. There's this chamber music like give and take between the soloist and the orchestra. The oboe playing and the slow movement is gorgeous. It's fantastic, absolutely fantastic. So, 
Zayat Meyer is one of the younger, well, younger, he's not so young anymore, but you know what I mean. Not dead. One of the, he's one of the undead. Let's put it that way. Well, not dead, not undead. Okay. Now we're going to talk about the, the classic, the golden oldies. The golden oldies, the great violinists of the earlier period. And these require so little recommendation from me. You know them. I know them. We all love them. I just have to run through them, right? And and they're self-recommending because they belong in every collection. Milstein, Nathan Milstein is fantastic in everything he did. A violinist of incredible taste, truly elevated taste, fabulously aristocratic and artistic in everything that he did. His autobiography makes fabulous reading, by the way. He was just as witty and marvelous a writer as he was a violinist. However, however, these are his mono recordings with the Pittsburgh Symphony and William Steinberg. This is EMI, which is now Warner. I don't know if this is still around. It was one of the great recordings of the century. But what you can find is his remake, which is every bit as fine. It's on Deutsche Grammophon with Eugen Jochum, no less that great, amazingly great Brahms conductor. So, you know, take your pick. You've got your Milsteins. He's one of the multiple Brahmsists. I mean, there may even be more than this. Who knows? That's the problem with all this stuff. But he's definitely one of the great ones. So he goes in the definite keeper pile. Another one of the great ones. Ah, so many. It's really almost painful to contemplate. Arthur Grumio, who also did it twice. The second time was with Colin Davis. And I think it was the new Philharmonia then, or the, one of the Philharmonias for Phillips. But earlier, earlier, this is the one to get. Because it's with it's with Edward von Bynum and the Concertgebouw. Oh, my, this is a classic. Von Bynum was one of the great all-time Brahms conductors. He was just stupid. Stupendously fabulous. And this, my friends, is one of the great Brahms violin conductors. I mean, Grumio is Grumio. Grumio was another aristocrat of the violin. Perfect for Brahms. You know, just amazingly tasteful, pointed, lyrical, fabulous, sensitive. You know, you know all those terms. You know, you just, just pick them out and take your adjectives and fill them in like Mad Libs. You know, it's just that simple. But with Von Bynum, you have an incredible partnership, an absolutely incredible partnership. And so I have to talk about that as one of the all-time great Brahms violin concertos and classic, classic by a master violinist. Of course, it's in the big Grumio box. Both of them are, and hopefully they're not the same performance, and we just don't know it yet <laughs> because Decca screwed that up too. I think it's uh, the Brahmses are okay, though. Seriously, they are. But boy, this Von Bynum Grumio, Yes, baby. Next. Ah, we have next is the disaster that always occurs when I do these videos. No, it wasn't a disaster. It's a minor catastrophe. Uh, yes, here we are. Heifetz. We got to talk about Heifetz. Heifetz and Reiner. <laughs> Heifetz and Reiner. You know, it, you, you do. I, you do get to a point where the sheer like legendary greatness of it all is kind of intimidating. But Heifetz and Reiner were a Perfect, perfect pairing, because Heifetz always, always had a reputation as somebody who was slightly cold as an interpreter, but of unbelievable technical finish. And Reiner had a reputation as a conductor who was slightly cold as an interpreter, but someone of unbelievable technical finish. And so you put them together, and holy mackerel, you get. I think, I think this one is probably as close to what Brahms imagined the work sounding like. And that's saying a lot because Brahms, you know, was also somewhat reserved emotionally, but a, you know, a, but a stickler, stickler for technical details and, and, and musicianship, you know, the highest, highest standards of scrupulous musicianship. And the, the reason Heifetz and Reiner, I think is important is because it, it tells you how far you can go um, in, in seeking technical perfection without sacrificing expressivity. And that's the key. Because Heifetz, for all that, you know, next to some other people, you know, he, you know <laughs> were like really heaving and panting slobs in this music. 
Heifetz was not that, but he was not inexpressive. He was never inexpressive. He was an extraordinarily communicative artist, and so was Reiner. So was Reiner. For all the emphasis on, on technical perfection and scrupulous musicianship, they both did not forget why they were there. And so I think that this Heifetz recording is the one that, you know, a lot of today's violinists should be like chained to their, their, their music stands and be forced to listen to until they understand that, that getting all the notes, however well you do it, is not the point of this thing. The point is to still be expressive while at the same time, you know, up, upholding a, an impossibly fabulous technical standard. That's the trick, and these guys do it. So that's absolutely one of the top, 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 top versions. It always has been since the day it came out. It's beyond fabulous. You have to own it. If you don't, you're, 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 you're not living the right kind of life. That goes without question. However, however, I do have my own preference, and my own preference, as I mentioned earlier, is Oistrock. Now, Oistrock, 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 Oistrock recorded this concerto at least four times. Um, it's in the Melodia collection. He did it once, I believe, on Deutsche Grammophone in mono. However, however, you get two stereo ones, and the two stereo ones are with, respectively, Cole Emperor and Zell. <laughs> and how do you choose between a Brahms violin concerto with Cole Emperor and Zell? That is something else. I mean, just the plot of it makes me drool. The plot, the thought of it makes me drool. And, you know, the, the, the cell one here was unavailable for years and years and years and years and years. It only finally came back sort of, well, this is a Japanese, Japanese one, but it was issued finally, you know, a decade or so ago. And then all it's packed up in the, the, the cell Warner box and, and in the, the Oistrock Great Recordings box. I mean, it's around. And which one is better? I, you tell me. I mean, I, I, Oistrock may be in slightly better form in the Klemper because it's earlier, but, you know, you don't want to give up cell playing this either because it's a real collaboration, or Klemperer for that matter. Klemperer is with, is with the Orchestre National de la Radio Diffusion Française, which is really kind of cool. Française, actually, I think, yes, there's an E there. Um, and it sounds just totally like Klemperer. It makes no difference. But you know what really interests me about this? I, I have to say, this is, what, this is what really blows my mind, is that the timings are identical within seconds. And that's really, really interesting because, you know, Klemper was supposed to be sort of slow and heavy and Zell was supposed to be sort of light and, and tight-lipped and, 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 you know, quick and zippy and, and, and classical and Klemper was craggy and granitic and monolithic and Oistrock is Oistrock. But the timings come out almost exactly the same, which says that they were, that Klemper wasn't is as heavy duty as he was often, you know, rumored to be. And Zell was not as, you know, anal fixated as he was rumored to be. I think that that's a wonderful, wonderful comparison, as much for the orchestra as for the violinist, because it really does say that no matter what happens, we have to keep listening, don't we? Because we can never, ever rely on our prejudices or our assumptions when real-time listening is available and it provides the truth, the absolute unvarnished factual per truth, 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 thank you. And so, my friends, for the Brahms Violin Concerto, I would recommend that you must have, well, all of these, <laughs> and maybe, maybe a few more, but at a minimum, at a minimum, you've got to get one of the Oistrox. And then the sky is the limit. All the rest is up to you. So keep on listening, my friends. Thank you so much for joining me. Take care.